Hello and welcome to this session. First of all, big thanks to the Google Developers Group in Sweden for inviting me to give this talk today. Today we're going to talk about CubeSat technology in the 2020s. My name is Sakke Terikoski and I'm a global shaper, future thinker from Global Utmaning in Sweden, a think tank. But I'm also a development engineer at GOMSpace Sweden, so a part of a European satellite manufacturing company. And I will be your host for the next few minutes doing a talk about CubeSat technology in the 2020s. So what can we expect technology-wise from CubeSat technology in this decade? This will be the topic we're talking about. And actually, it's really fascinating that you have the hashtag thought space here somewhere in this corner on the screen, because space is of course exactly what we will be talking about today. So what is a CubeSat? A CubeSat is essentially the device you have on the picture behind me. It's a satellite sized, uh, very small with cubes such as this block of 10 times 10 times 10 centimeters. So the name cubes that actually comes from the fact that the first ones were exactly sized of this cube. And then with satellite technology maturing in this field, people were able to build cube sets of double the size, three times the size, six times the size, and so on. And the one you have on the picture behind me is two times the size of a U, as they call this in the CubeSat business. So why CubeSats? I mean, the miniaturization has made it possible to make smaller electronics and smaller circuit boards over the decades now. And that has also made it possible to make electronics smaller. You all recognize these devices, of course, from everyday life. That's also making technology smaller and more effective. And the same goes for satellites these days. So it's possible to make satellites smaller and more affordable. Actually, even more affordable to send up to space and to manufacturing numbers. This is actually the big advantage of CubeSat technology these days and has been for the past decade when the industry has really existed. CubeSat technology makes it possible for manufacturers worldwide to make satellites in numbers and smaller so that they can actually be cheaper to buy for customers who want to use it. Customers who can be you know, different states who want to have their own space program but can't afford the big traditional satellites. It can also be startups who want to provide a space-based solution to their customers, but they don't have the means to buy any big satellites. But now they do have the chance to buy CubeSats because they are more affordable. And lastly, CubeSats are cheaper to get up to space because with the satellite the size of this, you don't need big rockets like the ones you used for shooting up the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. You can choose smaller rockets instead. And actually, a market of smaller, smaller launcher vehicles has also been blooming up during the past decade. Cubes, as they really went, the whole sector really took off with the student projects in the early 2000s. Universities, and especially technical universities, decided that they wanted to let their students have the opportunity to build small satellites to be able to just test their skills and get something actually fired up to space already in the time when they are students. So in its project works before their thesis, before they go out to working life after university. So this is actually the idea where CubeSats all came from. It was all educational purposes in the beginning. And now when those students later graduated, they became founders and CEOs of CubeSat companies out there in the world. And now we are seeing a blooming CubeSat industry 20 years later. And this is where we are now in the 2020s. And of course, everything that I have told you now, for those of you who are familiar with CubeSat technology from before, constellations, cheaper prices, the democratization of space and a new space like concept in general is maybe already familiar. So this is what you have heard. This is what people have told you during the past 10 years. But I'm going to try to make this talk something that will give you the opportunity to look ahead. What's next? What's coming now? So with CubeSats, you have the issue that when you manufacture them in series and you are able to make big constellations where these satellites can actually work together as a group in space, the space easily gets crowded. You know the discussion about uh, Elon Musk's project, the Starlink satellite, which is a very, very cool initiative to make a constellation of 12,000 satellites in orbit around the Earth to provide a space-based broadband internet solution. Well, you know, you have also probably heard the dilemma about you know, when you have 12,000 satellites around the Earth in an orbit roughly on the same height or altitude as it's ca called in the space sector, causing a lot of problems when it comes to the potential risk of collisions. 
Space junk is actually the biggest problem and challenge and, and even security threat to our space infrastructure today. The amount of debris objects is only getting larger when, or, uh, and potentially much larger when more constellations are being fired up to space and you see the situation where the probability and risk of collision just becomes getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Space debris, as you know, it can be anything from old objects and debris pieces that were fired up to space already in the beginning of the space race in the Cold War days. Or it can just be something like that an astronaut drops like a tool from his hand during a spacewalk, for example. All these debris objects remain in orbit around Earth. It's very difficult to go there and actually clean it up. Although in this decade, we are also seeing a lot of attempts to, to make such clean up maneuvers with different projects. So what to do about this? Well, collision avoidance could be one thing that you could do on a satellite level to try to mitigate the problem of at least getting more space junk. So when you have uh, satellites in orbit, you would of course want to make sure that they do not collide with anything else in the orbit, not with other satellites and especially not with other space junk objects out there. So something really smart would be to equip your satellite with propulsion systems, for example, that make it possible to make maneuvers for avoiding collision objects. So if you have another satellite coming at you, you will be able to avoid it. And these maneuvers are pretty tricky to do and something that people are researching on to do at the moment. And during the coming 10 years, so up from this year to 2030, this technology will be something that will mature. It will for sure be something that people will talk about much more. And it's already actually being talked about that collision avoidance mechanisms should be something that you should have on a satellite in order to be a responsible user of space, in order to not make it, so to speak, irresponsible to just get a lot of satellites out there, but not find out any way to handle it when things go in the worst possible way and you get collisions. Because if you have a space constellation with let's say 1000 satellites and you start to have collisions on one altitude above earth, then that can easily lead to a chain reaction. And, and the collision avoidance is all about trying to avoid that happening. Something else that you probably will see during the coming decade and something is, that is being researched very actively on is rendezvous and docking with CubeSats. Rendezvous and docking basically means that you have two satellites coming close to each other and ultimately then touching. So actually coming together to exchange information or, or something similar. And rendezvous with docking is something that is of course done when you send people to the International Space Center, for example. You have to have the people actually you know, dock to the Space Center to be able to enter. But with CubeSats, this is still something new. And, and it would be, if I just tie into what I just said about collision avoidance, if we would have propulsion systems on an abundant number of satellites, then that would actually mean that you have uh, uh, propellant on these satellites in most cases. And, and what happens when the propellant runs out? Well, then you cannot do any collision avoidance anymore. But another thing that has been ongoing research for some years now is if you would actually be able to have satellites that are there for maintenance. So refueling satellites, for example, and this is a, still a future vision because before you can start thinking about these maneuvers where you can actually have a, like a maintenance satellite in orbit to aid other satellites and refuel them, you of course need to be really good when it comes to rendezvous and docking and to be able to actually make sure that the precision and, and timing is exactly what you want to have. And actually the European Space Agency at the moment has a planned mission to, to test this with two CubeSats. So and that's very, very interesting. Finally, what's maybe the most interesting part of the future of the CubeSat technology and something we can really look forward to in this decade are the steep space missions. Remember all this talk about asteroid mining that you heard already a couple of years ago. I think it was even Barack Obama when he was president that he already talked about, you know, the possibility of one day sending asteroids satellites out there to mine asteroids and get resources for space. And this has of course been something that spawned a lot of companies back in, in the previous decade and a lot of interest. But if you think about asteroid mining as a concept, the first thing you need to do is to have something go out to the asteroid and prospect the rocks to check what minerals are out there, check if the asteroid is worth mining. Kind of the same thing as a mineralogist would do, like going into the forest and look at a rock and see if, okay, is this place actually worth mining at all? So you would do the same thing with satellites. And in order to be able to target a lot of asteroids and make the prospecting part cheaper, you would, of course, use a CubeSat. So what people are looking into now, and this is really interesting, are missions to go with CubeSats out to asteroids. So actually send these tiny things 
to deep space where the environment is harsher, not very much uh, like around the Earth, where close to the Earth orbit, where you still have the magnetic field protecting from some part of the radiation, for example, but you have satellites out there in the real, real harsh environment and even further away from the sun in many cases, so you even get less power to the solar panels. This is a technically very demanding mission. NASA actually already in 2018 managed to send two CubeSats to Mars with the so-called Mars Cube 1 satellites, A and B as they were called, MARCO for short. Maybe that is more familiar as, a, as an abbreviation. And now when it comes to the satellites, to asteroids, this will be more abundant than in this decade. And actually ESA has a really cool mission ongoing at the moment and planned called the HERA mission, which is also very much about getting new science and knowledge about asteroids in general. And HERA is a big device that will travel to deep space and, and make a close encounter with an asteroid, but also HERA will carry, according to the plan, two CubeSats with it. And this is something that you who are watching this, you just have to promise me that you will go and check out this mission after you watch this video, because that is actually really cool if you think about the possibility to actually have the CubeSat to land on an asteroid. Then we are close to prospecting, I will tell you. And here we have the first slide of that presentation. You see a picture with the anatomy of a CubeSat. So basically what I showed you before, the small box of 10 times 10 times 10 centimeters, what it looks on the inside is basically this. The satellite consists of an antennas, a magnetometer, power supply, of course an onboard computer, very important. Lastly, solar cells all around it. Of course, when you are in space, then the energy source for actually operating your satellite largely comes from the sun. So solar power is really, really, really important for, for these. And of course, in the frame, the thing I had already here on the table, what uh, holds everything together. And this slide I just want to use to illustrate the concept of a constellation. So this is a picture from ESA, or actually also the previous picture was borrowed from ESA, uh, where the concept of CubeSat constellation is shown. So here, actually, CubeSats work as a group in space on the same heights over the Earth, but over different positions over the Earth, so that they can actually exchange information and work together as a group, making data transfer truly, truly fast. So this is the whole idea of having CubeSat constellation, and that so many different new applications will come out of this in this decade. For example, like Internet of Things applications and so on, communication and so on. Now, this slide I want to just use to illustrate what different types of missions there are out there. So this is also borrowed from ESA once again. ESA, they make lovely PowerPoint slides and they are lovely to use in presentations. You can actually see some of the ones I mentioned here. You see the rendezvous docking, rendezvous and docking mission there in the very middle. You also see the uh, asteroid missions that I talked about, so the Hera CubeSats and, and others. Then you also have some actually that are made by the company that I work at, so GOMSpace. So for example, if you look to the very left of the picture where you have the Earth and then some satellites in low Earth orbit around it, you will notice GOMEX-4B and GOMEX-3, which are actually made by the company that I am working at at the moment. And, and finally, and one last slide from ESA, uh, where I just want to show also the many different cases that you can use CubeSats for. You have a lot of these uh, applications, everything from education where it all started to, to scientific studies and remote sensing and communication satellites, and of course, deep space exploration that I talked about. And, and everything just coming with these small satellites that are not much larger than a shoebox. Remember the thing I told you in the beginning, a satellite not much larger than a shoebox, it can still deliver a lot of different things in space. And that's what makes it so cool. Uh, also on this slide, in the very, in the very middle, you can also see uh, Mars as an example. So satellite missions to Mars are something that we can look forward to even more than just the ones that were sent in 2018. Also satellite missions to the moon, of course. Finally, I want to lift one last example that I think personally is very exciting. NASA, they have a plan to actually make a CubeSat constellation that will monitor the sun. It will, they will work together as a group as kind of a virtual large radio telescope direct at the sun to measure the properties of uh, the particles coming out and actually to see and monitor when the sun releases giant solar particle storms. And this is of course to, to help us to know more about space weather and solar storms. And, and that is critical if we want to be able to be able to uh, protect astronauts who are traveling far to the moon and to the Mars in the future, because like I said before, the radiation environment is much 
tougher there than here around the Earth, where we still have the magnetic field protecting us. So this mission is also something that is planned for this decade and is going to be very exciting to follow the progress of Sunrise, as this is called. Finally, I just want to make sure that you all hear about one enterprise that is making uh, very much information about the CubeSats in general. Spaceworks is actually uh, an entity that makes uh, reports and, and articles about CubeSat uh, technology in terms of numbers. So what I have told you in this speech is much about the concepts and the technology and the things we could make. But these guys, they really have the numbers. They really know the year when things are done and how much is done and how many different kinds of missions are, are in the pipeline to be made. So, so check out there if you want to know more information. The slide I'm displaying here is actually a, a look back at previous years. So how has this sector developed since 2010 in the early days of the industry of CubeSats to this day in 2020? And in 10 years from now, you will have another of these pictures displaying this decade and most likely containing almost everything that I mentioned at this page, if not exactly everything. So, and you know what the best part is? The best part is that the adventure is actually just waiting for developers like you to make it a reality. And I have only touched upon a tiny bit of the cake here. I think the cake is actually much larger. There is so much potential for this industry and only the imagination will set the limits for what you can actually do with, with the CubeSat missions that are planned and that you could also be a part of planning. So only the imagination sets the boundaries and maybe also gravity will set the boundaries and you will inevitably have a power budget also when it comes to how much power you can get from the sun. But, but basically only imagination can set the boundaries. And I like to, to thank you for watching this video. Thank you very much for Google Developers Group in Sweden to invite me to talk about this. I hope you are more interested in the cubes of technology of the future now than you were 10 minutes ago. And I just want to conclude by saying thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.